It's time for us to call upon our next speaker. We would now have the bird's eye topic discussed for which I would like to call upon our next speaker, Mr. Melvin Pryor. Melvin has specially traveled from UK to be a part of this convention and he is very very excited to talk to you students. Mr. Melvin holds a degree in Geography, a postgraduate diploma in Economic Development and has a vast background in tour operations, archaeology and freelance copywriting in travel. Prior to being a director at the University College Birmingham, Mr. Pryor was the Dean of the School of Tourism. Mr. Pryor possesses over 25 years of teaching experience both at UCB and other institutes across the globe. Mr. Pryor also acts as an aggregator for the Institute of Hospitality, appraising educational programs around the world. With a huge round of applause, can we have on stage Mr. Melvin Pryor? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> to keep you awake, the prize at the end of my talk is the car. No, I'm just joking. I just want to check if you're awake. As you've heard, my name is Melvin Pryor. I'm a lecturer. I was a lecturer in tourism, so that's my background. I have to be honest with you, and you've heard it from previous speakers, but the first job I had in the travel industry was painful. I was very naive and very young. We didn't have conventions like this in the UK. You went to a careers advisor, and when I told him I wanted to work in travel and tourism, he just thought geography, because that's what they do in the UK. If you don't know what you want to do, you're told to study geography. <laughs> Having actually graduated with a geography degree, I was basically employed. I had no skills, really. I couldn't really do anything. But I wanted to work in travel. And I saw a job advertised in Manchester in England, which looked the business. All I had to do was meet people on a coach going from Britain to Spain, check them into their hotels, and then collect them at the end of the trip and take them back to the border with France, for them to catch a bus back to England. It was easy, or so I thought. I went for an interview in Manchester at 10 o'clock in the morning, by 12 o'clock, I'd finished my training for the job, and I should have realized that there was perhaps something wrong with this job at that stage. <laughs> a week later, I caught the coach from Manchester down to Spain. And when I got on there, as part of my training, they gave me a box, and it had a uniform in it. And the company used what we call the Disneyfication, meaning a one-size-fits-all. The only problem was, all the uniforms were designed for Darth Vader. You would have had to have been about this tall. <laughs> and so, when I put the trousers on, they were right down here. And the manager said, don't worry, we have a solution for that. And he came out with a staple gun. So they stapled my trousers here, the back of my jacket. If I'd have been on airport duty on that job, I would have set every alarm off in, basically in Spain. But the whole point is, that was how the business was 35 years ago in Europe. It was amateurish. They employed people like me, so they must have been amateurish. <laughs> I was working in Spain, and you would assume that I would have linguistic qualities. Well, I knew two Spanish words. Hola, hello, and basically gracias, thank you. That was it. And yet I had to deal with hoteliers half of whom who then didn't speak English. It was basically a recipe for disaster. I was dealing with clients at that stage whose only motivation to go on a holiday was cheap alcohol. They weren't interested in culture, they weren't interested in, well, in me, they weren't interested in anything whatsoever. And I think what basically brought it home to me is I had one incident near the end of the trip which made me ask myself, was the tourism industry really for me? One hotel I dealt with in the resort of Calella was called the Hotel Cactus. 
And it was called the Hotel Cactus because in the square, in the middle of the hotel, there was a 16-foot cactus. It was massive. And it was the hotel owner's pride and joy. Basically, he would have his photograph taken with it. His family, all of them were presented to the cactus. And unfortunately, on one of the trips I was running, I checked a group out and four English lads hadn't got on the coach. So I ran back into the hotel and shouted up in the courtyard. And as I did so, the window opened and the lads thought it would be really amusing to open one of their friend's suitcases and throw all their belongings over this cactus tree. And I was faced a naive rep looking at this hotel owner's cactus tree covered with underpants, socks, and things like this. <laughs> you have to ask yourself, what would you do in my position? Well, I took a really bad decision that day. I decided to get a ladder and climb up it and retrieve the underpants and socks. And then the cactus started falling in. And as I did that, the hotel manager came out and went ballistic at me. And that's when I learned my third word of Spanish, lo cientos, I am sorry. <laughs> and basically, I was really, really sorry. And at the end of that season, I was seriously wondering why on earth I'd ever wanted to go into this particular business. But I also knew that if I wanted to move on in life, I needed to go on and get more education. I needed to get some skills. And really, that's what I'm talking to you about today, because many of you are possibly will be in the same situation as I was. Very naive, perhaps not possessing the skills, the people skills, the knowledge to actually do something in what is the world's biggest business. And I'm just looking around for, can someone switch the slide? Right, okay. Uh, right, this is going to be challenging. Um, in the years since that time, our industry has changed immeasurably. And what I'm going to do is tell you what it's like to be in Europe at the moment. Because 35 years ago, our industry was in its infancy. Now, we have a lot more experienced, discerning customers. Or at least these are customers who think they're experienced. Unfortunately, we deal with a lot of people who think they know it all. They think they know everything about the airline service, the airline route. They're experts on everything. We deal with a lot of new consumers. What's the world's number one country for supplying tourists? For supplying tourists around the world? China. 98 million tourists from China. They are by far the world's biggest one. How many of you speak Mandarin? Right. Well, don't look at me because I don't speak it either. I'm, I'm, you know I'm lousy at Spanish. So the point is, we're dealing with new consumers internationally and within our own countries, within the UK, within Europe. We're dealing with a rise in new consumers for both tourism, hospitality and the culinary products. We've also got knowledgeable customers we're dealing with, customers who you can use TripAdvisor and other means to find out information on our product or service. If we make a mistake, we can be found out really, really quickly. Reputations can be damaged. And at the end of the day, the tourists I was leading in my first job would do anything if the price was cheapest. Now it's about quality as well as price. It's value for money. And then we have changes in our business. Our business now, particularly in Europe, is so diversified. There are so many types of accommodation product, tourism product, that we have lots of different types of event organizations. And trying to encapsulate what our industry is about is now really, really difficult. We have the drive of experience, education, and excitement. These are things that are buzzing around our new product development, and I'll show you a few of those in a bit. We have the celebrity products and services. I don't know if it's the same here, but in Europe we have the fancy magazines. If you see Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie on holiday in a destination, you can bet your life within two weeks, loads of people will be wanting to go there. 
This is basically how our industry is driven. Likewise with restaurants, eating habits, certainly in Europe now, we're becoming a celebrity-led culture. And at the bottom, we've got the whole idea, of certainly of people traveling, not just for relaxation, but to be stimulated mentally. Again, the only stimulation my tourists had in my first job was could they get in the bar quick enough and could they stay there all day. And another challenge if you're in our business, dealing with all the stakeholders, particularly this one. The shareholders, you're answerable to them when you're in the business, if you don't make a profit, if you don't match up with the other expectations. Okay? And so, this is a very kind of simple diagram of what our industry is about, which we would show our students back in the UK. It is very, very complicated. People think doing a hospitality management course is simply about hotels. It's not. It's much, much bigger than that. Likewise, people assume if you do a tourism course, you work for an airline or a travel agent. And again, you've got everything from boutique hotels, budgeting, contract catering, all of them requiring sort of different demands and skills, all of them expanding. Uh, just to give you some idea of this, these are some of my students. I asked them, what is our industry about from your perspective? And this is one of my students, he's Tunisian. He says it's about being creative, it's being accountable, and it's about profit. Uh, this is a French student, and here, like a lot of our students, it's about people management. Getting the most out of your staff. And again, that's backed up. This is a Chinese student. A uh, big part here, social media. Social media is fine, but you basically have to monitor it continually. And again, we've got people employed in that field. Uh, one of our Indian students from Delhi about the effective use of technology in the marketplace. And this is a Thai, Thai student talking about the need to have environmental sustainability to basically cut your costs. And so all of these in common, you can start to see some of the key ingredients feeding into basically the future of our industry. And again, this is a culinary student. It's all about imagination and giving people what they realize they may now need because sometimes people don't realize that about our product. And so these are the key trends which drive what we teach in my university. We teach a lot about product development different types of products and services. We do a lot now in the UK on marketing, particularly branding and the use of e-based marketing. We look at responsibility, whoops, and finally, investors, because it's a money interest. And if you put all of that together, you get this diagram. And this is called the bubbling pot. If you imagine a chef has got a soup bowl and the pot is bubbling and every so often different bubbles come to the top. And if you want to be a manager today, you've got to basically be an expert really in all of those things. You've got to be an expert on everything from facility design to client care, crisis management, everything. And can we teach that in colleges and universities? No, it's impossible. And so, the whole issue is, why should you study at postgraduate level? A key thing is that you do not study at that level to learn about knowledge. It's impossible. The American philosopher David Landis tells us that, basically, it's not what you learn, it's how you learn. You've got to become very fast learners in the future. 
so that if something happens, you can respond really, really fast. And so when you do a qualification, the employers we work with tell us that shows your potential to learn. It doesn't necessarily mean you know anything. It just means that you can learn fast. You need enthusiasm to work in our industry, as you've heard from previous speakers. Basically, if you can imagine working with people who are really getting on your nerves all day, you've got to smile, and basically you've got to be with them the whole time. We tell a story in Birmingham about uh, one of our students who worked as cabin crew for British Airways. And she was on a transatlantic flight, and a businessman called her over and said, excuse me, madam, he said, uh, I'd like a scotch on the rocks. And she said to him, yes, sir, that will be fine. And he said, oh, there's one more thing. Give me a smile as well. So she took his order and gave him a smile. And then when she came back with her drink, she gave it to the businessman and he said, thank you. And she said, right, I'd like you to do one thing for me. And the businessman said, name it. And she said, well, this is my smile. Now you smile. And so the businessman went, and then she said, Right, hold it for 14 hours, because that's what our business is about. So, what sort of things do the likes of what we teach in the UK? If you're a postgraduate student, we do not generally use many textbooks, but we do what we call experiential learning. It's live learning. It's real. We do it for companies. Students make mistakes when they do this. But that's life, and you learn from those mistakes. And so this is one project that I was involved with recently. I had a group of 30 students, and we were approached by the mayor of a town in Italy, and we had to decide what he was going to do with some renovated houses. It's real learning. And so generally, in the United Kingdom, and through my work with the Institute of Hospitality, we can identify there are three types of courses. You've got career development programs. This is for people who have studied the subject before, particularly in the culinary arts or hospitality. You've got career entry programs. This is for people who know nothing about our business. And finally, you've just got general programs. So if any of you are thinking of postgraduate study, really you should be looking at the first one because we assume you've already got some basic operational skills. That's just the entry criteria. Can you keep going forward, please? And I mean, that's again roughly what it involves. One important thing is if you study in the UK, you'll find it's very different from India. Generally, students do not study every single day in classes. You have a lot more freedom to pursue your own in church projects. Now, I'm going to give you one, finally, one particular example of this. We were hoping that Tajinda would be with us today, but he can't because he's traveling. Tajinda studied tourism. And he was working in Jaipur for a number of years for a tour operator, and he decided to do a master's. In particular, his motivation was that he wanted to start his own business, because in our industry, you have a lot of people who go off and start small companies. And in Tajinda's case, he was particularly interested in doing something with disabled people. And you can see it's partly to do with uh, his grandmother. This was a major market because in Europe alone, you had 38 million disabled registered people. That's a significant market, and no one was providing holiday products for them. Certainly not outside Europe. In 2011, having done his tour program, he did a research project. And what we did is we looked at the Taj Mahal and we did a tour around the Taj Mahal with someone in a wheelchair. 
Where were the problems in getting people up steps and things? And then we went to the Forta Agra and again we tried to get people up there. Tejinda then wrote that up and he identified a number of problems and then he found a company in China which manufactured special equipment for use with wheelchairs. He then bought some of that equipment and that formed the basis of his business which was called Able Journeys. And basically the two of us sat together and we looked at where we should design a program first. The key thing about India is that there are many different potential world-beating attractions in the country. But at the moment, the marketing is simply not good enough here. And so we have to stick in the main with the golden triangle for these initial products. And this is how the product was launched in 2011. We then entered a competition, and we'll, I didn't, Tejinda did, and he won. And again, what they don't teach you in college or university is, what do you do if you've got the services of the world's biggest pub, uh, public relations company for free for one year? How do you actually use that? No one's going to teach you that. And basically, that's when you network with people to find out everything you can do. They designed these logos for him. And a website. And now he moved from disabled people to organizing holidays in India for people from Europe who were deaf or visually impaired, blind. And he also used volunteers, so he would pay people to go out with people to describe what the Taj Mahal was like, for example. And this product really started taking off, but not in Europe. Okay, so this is, this is the company logo. And... So as we come up to date, his company now is one of the biggest companies of its kind in Europe. The market has, is starting to develop in Europe, but his main market at the moment is the USA. And basically, he's now adding destinations around the world. So you can see there, Ecuador, Europe, and we're also looking at destinations such as South Africa. But these are the challenges you face. It sounds very easy to do this sort of thing. Firstly, developing the brand on a limited budget. The cost elements of things like exhibitions were very, very high if you're a small business starting off. Developing the volunteer program part was also extremely complicated. Reaching the market, and technology again, a problem. But the final one was an interesting one. And again, imagine how you would react with this. In 2014, he was approached by the Government of India Tourist Office to give them advice on disabled facilities at the Taj Mahal and other things. Right. That may seem very noble, but think about it. If the facilities were improved, he would lose his business. And so, basically, you can see it's a real problem. How much does he tell them? Otherwise, he's got no business in the future. And this is just where he's going to date. South Africa, Malaysia, Dubai, and Australia. So, just finally, anybody can be like Tejinda. Tejinda was not academic. It's about drive and enthusiasm. As you heard from an earlier speaker, it's about having fun as well. And there's a lot of opportunities in the future. I should stress, in terms of what happened to me after I finished with the disaster company I work with, I went back into the industry after two years as a copywriter. And I worked in Germany. And in Germany, the system's very different. You were much more respected. And basically, from there, I carried on in travel, going into teaching. 
One of the key things I think you should remember is you're based in India and what you're experiencing at the moment in your industry is probably what we experienced in the UK about 25 years ago. The industry will change here in the future as demand goes up. India is already number 13 amongst global world spenders on tourism products. And basically, the revenue is coming in for destinations. So, I'm just going to leave you with one final wish, and that's that I wish you every good fortune in the future. Stick with our industry as well. Thank you.